Okay, hi again. And now we've talked about the model of communication and the ways to empowerment. We're going to move on to the idea of presuppositions, which are ideas that successful people have had. So again, I bring you back to this idea that NLP comes about through modeling successful people. And you can bet your bottom dollar that John Grinder, Richard Bandler, and the other people that have progressed NLP have noticed that successful people in the world often have common ways of looking at the world. And likewise, people who have difficulties often have also common and opposite ways of looking at life. And so we're going to go through some what we call presuppositions of NLP, which are empowering in themselves if you look at them. And as you go through one by one, you notice that if you look through kind of the lens of this presupposition, looking at the world, you'll be much more empowered to do something about the world. Now, I must reiterate that there's nothing to prove that these presuppositions are fact or they're just made up. But you'll see and you'll notice there's plenty of anecdotal information and you'll notice it feels right that if you can sort of see life this way, you'll feel uh, much more resourceful and much more powerful to go about life. So let's look at these now. So the first presupposition is the map is not the territory. And we talked about our friend Alfred Kozybski. Well, Alfred's uh, famous dictum was this particular one, the map is not the territory. And as we go through these presuppositions, have a thought, think to yourself as I'm explaining them what they mean to you. But this first one really says that what we think inside our heads is never the real world. And so everyone has a map, if you like, of how they represent the world. And none of those maps are the same as each other, and none of them are exactly the same as the real world. Now, what this means is that nobody has the correct map of reality. So one should be somewhat humble in we consider that our own point of view is necessarily flawed. It is definitely not perfect because we can never ever know everything about the real world. So the map is not the territory in the same way that we don't know, say for example, what the territory looks like between here and Melbourne if we're only using a map from uh, where we live to say Melbourne. And uh, likewise, when we think about a situation where we might have had an argument or whatever, we don't know all the details, the history, etc. So having this humbling opinion uh, gives us the power to first of all be open to other interpretations, but also realize that no one else has a perfect view of life. So this is one of the most fundamental and very empowering presuppositions of NLP. Okay, the next one is everyone has the resources they need to solve their problems. So the way I like to look at this as well is when we were a baby, we never really had any problems. All the stresses and anxieties and worries and the desire of wealth and fame and all of that came about through learning, through making decisions that that's what we wanted when we were younger. So all these stresses and strains came about at one stage when we were younger. And we have the resources within us to dissolve all of those problems because we created them in the first place. So no matter how disempowered someone is, you can rely that deep down within them, within their unconscious mind, they have the tools required to solve their problems. And as a facilitator, we are simply that. It's a good idea not to think that we're the person that's going to cure them but have more the view that we are the facilitator that allows people to cure themselves of their own problems. Now the next presupposition which is empowering is the body and mind are a cybernetic loop. So what is interesting is that any 
uh, thoughts that are running through the mind at any time are somehow reflected in the body. Now, if you come on our trainings and you become very uh, sensory aware, what we call sensory acuity, you become aware of people's um, flushes in their face, the slight movements of their body, you'll find an interesting things happen. Sometimes you can see a thought going through a person's mind just by their body reacting to it, or you know, a strain on their face or something like that, before they even have a conscious recognition that they're thinking those thoughts. It's very strange. I sometimes say, oh, something happened there. What happened to you just then? And people go, oh, really? Oh, yeah, I did have this negative thought or positive thought. So the body is reflected in the mind and the mind is reflected in the body. The meaning of the communication is the response that it elicits. This one's a little confusing at first, but it is empowering. So have a think what it means to you. What uh, it means to me is that we take responsibility for the response that anyone gives us to our communication. So if I said something and I meant to be nice, um, gee, you're looking beautiful today, and then they take that the wrong way and take it as if I'm being sarcastic or I'm being sleazy or something like that. Whose fault is it? 99% of the world would turn around and say, you took that the wrong way and blame the other person. But in NLP, that is giving our power away. So this presupposition says we are responsible for molding our communication to get the meaning that we want across. So we have to think to ourselves, right, well, I'm never going to communicate to that particular person in that particular way again because I get misrepresented. I need to change the way I communicate. So it's my responsibility and the meaning of the communication is the response that it elicits. Next one, each behavior has a positive intention. So this is very important when you get people that have done negative things or have negative behaviors, <clears throat> even things like self-harm or addictions. In order to assist people like that, it's really important to ask yourself, what is the positive intention behind this negative deed? So if someone's somehow abusing themselves, you know, they must get a payoff. Some people call it secondary gain. And the idea is you can never uh, change that behavior until you've satisfied the secondary gain. So, for example, if someone's feeling uh, left out or lonely or and resorts to something like overeating or whatever, you need to first of all, concentrate on resolving that negative emotion, that negative feeling, by helping them out of that, by letting them either see the light or helping them in some other way uh, so they don't feel uh, left out or lonely, etc., before you then concentrate on changing the behavior uh, that is causing them harm. Even if people like are harming others, you know, you have to question yourself what uh, is their what is their positive gain that they're getting out of this? Um, because they're doing it for some reason in themselves. Another one which is extremely popular in NLP and elsewhere is saying there is no failure, only feedback. I mean, we are failing often, don't we? Everyone fails often, but the people who succeed are not the people that don't fail. They're the people that learn from their mistakes, get up and do it better the second time. The old adage of Thomas Edison, he made a thousand light bulbs and someone, a reporter, asked him, what was it like to fail 999 times? And he said, I didn't fail 999 times. I succeeded 999 times in finding out how not to make a light bulb. And if he'd have given up after 10 or 20 failures, he would never have got the success that he did. So this is a good one to repeat to yourself every day or every time you have even a small failure. There is no failure. There's only feedback to make us better the next time. If someone else can do it, then I can too. You've heard this one before, right? This is the presupposition on which all NLP is based. If someone else can do it, 
then if I model them, if I copy their actions, their words and the way they think, then there's no reason why I can't do it too. Very empowering. If what you are doing isn't working, then do something else. So this is what we call behavioral flexibility. In other words, it's often said that uh, immature people, if something doesn't work, they'll just increase the amplitude. So if they raise their voice and they don't get a reaction, they'll shout. And if they don't get it shouting, they'll yell and stamp their feet. So they're just doing the same action, just at a higher amplitude. They don't think, right, I'm going to change the way I do this and use humor instead. Or I'll use silence instead to get attention. So it's very, very useful when you're trying to succeed to recognize whether what you're doing is working or not working. And if it is working, obviously redouble your efforts and, and keep going. But if it isn't working, change what you're doing. So that's behavioral flexibility. And there's a few stomachs, very funny stories that we talk about in our training to do with this NLP presupposition. Okay, the next one is memory, imagination and real-time events use the same neurological circuits. In other words, this is why we can practice certain activities to get good at in real life. In NLP, our trainings are really practical. So we teach someone to use a technique and then we split up into twos and threes and we go away and practice it. And we actually take the knowledge and put it in the muscle, so to speak. And it's this practice which allows us to do it in real life. And if it wasn't for this presupposition, then it wouldn't work. Now, elite athletes know this very well. And all elite athletes, uh, well, the, the good ones, when you talk to them, are practicing in their mind's eye, say, for example, that perfect dive off the diving board or that perfect weight lift or whatever. They go through and or that ski jump. When they're at the top of the ski ski jump, um, according to uh, interviews, they're going over and over that perfect jump in their mind's eye because by reinforcing that neural pathway in your mind, the body will follow suit and do it in real life. So um, this is very, very useful in um, using things to either break or create new habits or create new behaviors. And then the last one that we've got today is distinguish between the person and the behavior. Okay, this has similarities to every behavior has a positive intention. Um, and it is simply to notice or take the presupposition that although we do bad things and all of us are guilty of doing bad behaviors from time to time, there is no such thing as a bad person. And that deep down, everyone just wants happiness and wants to do the best they can and to help themselves and others. And it's due to ignorance that we really undertake these bad behaviors. You know, it's particularly important if you're going to, say, work with people that have done crimes, etc. Um, you're not going to be much help to a criminal if you go into the counseling session with the idea that this criminal is purely evil and beyond redemption you're not going to be of any assistance you've got to go in there with the idea that yes he's done some bad things but those are his behaviors but deep down that person is able to be helped and and change his or her self and the same goes for yourself you may have done uh, behaviors which you feel guilty about but that sh does not impinge on you as being a totally worthy uh, person that can become helpful and achieve great success into the future. So there are more presuppositions of NLP and we go through those more in the trainings but these are the main ones and gives you an idea of some of the viewpoints that successful people uh, use to look at the world which helps them feel empowered and be very resourceful uh, towards whatever they do. Okay. So these presuppositions are all very well and good to think about, but of course where they're really useful is if we actually use them. So now that you've been through the presuppositions, I have a challenge for you. Go away and try 
to live life through the lens of these new presuppositions. Choose a few which perhaps you're unfamiliar with and try it out one day. It's particularly important if you ever get into any form of uh, dispute or argument with someone, have a think about which presuppositions you're not looking through and then after the event, perhaps, or if you can in the event, but at least afterwards, replay in your mind how you might have reacted differently if you were looking uh, or thinking about that particular presupposition in uh, during the argument. And you might find that your behaviour might have been different and might have been uh, more successful or, or better or more empowered. So go ahead, try those presuppositions and when we meet on the come and try day, uh, let me know how you went. I'd be curious. So, uh, on to the next video.